I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the Exploratorium, its move. Um, how, I'm curious, how many of you actually attended the party on Tuesday night and actually went there? Oh, wow. Okay, great. So I don't have to, to explain as much about what we do. Um, but I want to sort of talk about the underpinnings of our process, and I'm kind of interested how this might apply to all of your processes as well. But I'm going to start with a little bit of history first. Um, we were founded in 1969 in San Francisco by the physicist uh, Frank Oppenheimer, brother of Robert Oppenheimer, uh, father of the atomic bomb. Uh, Frank actually worked on the atomic bomb as well and was blacklisted along with his brother in the 50s and actually couldn't teach in any universities. So founding the museum for him was a project of actually democratizing science from the start. He was very intentionally political about it. He was very intentionally wanting to make science as interactive and put people in direct contact with natural phenomena wherever possible. And that, that philosophy has been an underpinning of our work ever since. We started very informally. It was basically one day in September of 69 where somebody left the door open at the Palace of Fine Arts and people wandered in and they said, I guess we're open, right? Okay. So, but that informality has stayed with us. We've, we've always prided ourselves in being more of a laboratory, more of a prototyping barn than really a formal museum. And in fact, one of the big concerns with our move is that we would become too formal. And hopefully we were able to keep some of that informality and that laboratory um, way of thinking with our move. From the start, the focus was on natural phenomena and natural curiosity. We did not want to try to create lessons that had to be learned in a formal way, but actually things where people were propelled by their own curiosity. And in a sense, one of the metaphors we used a lot was that we wanted to create a woods of natural phenomena that you could just wander through and guided by your own curiosity, find the natural phenomena that you wanted to inquire into more deeply. A big focus on that was science. We've mentioned that. But scientific phenomena explored socially, not alone, but actually in interactions with other people. A second part of that was the art. From the start, we had artists in residencies and we had actually artists exploring the same natural phenomena from, this, from their standpoint. This is the famous sun painting that actually takes the light of the sun and disperses it in different ways and then visitors interact with that light. And then of course, human perception as the bridge between the human body, mind, and the world of phenomena out there, always mediated by human perception. So from the start, building in perceptual experiences to the museum wasn't just a curiosity of illusions, but really was the sort of foundation of the scientific process of inquiring into the world. So we were founded over 40 years ago. We've spread our exhibits, and they've been copied all over the world. Some have credited the Exploratorium with launching a revolution in hands-on science education. These are some of the locations worldwide where we have actually collaborated with other museums to create exhibits. We are, however, more than a museum. Our online platform is actually another type of museum of digital experiences, of things that we can't do easily on the museum floor. It started as a magazine. We were one of the first museums on the web and growing still to this day. We also have various different institutes where we train teachers, educators of different sorts in our core philosophy of, of inquiry-based learning. And also our role in the arts and assembling discourses about the arts, the role of arts in learning, the role of arts in epistemology and ways of knowing. This was a recent conference that was funded by the National Science Foundation but held at our, at our location. So as you probably know, we have moved. We moved from the beautiful idyllic location over here at the Palace of Fine Arts to Pier 15 and 17 over here on the waterfront. We right now are down about here somewhere. Um, so why did we move? Many reasons. One of them was, of course, the location was beautiful but quite inaccessible. If you don't watch out, you wind up in Marin if you don't know exactly where you're going or the old location. And um, it was hard to get to by public transit. I personally live in Berkeley and it's much easier for me to get to work as it is for all of the families and other audience members in the whole East Bay. So it really changed our dynamic in our community by moving. We had also run out of space and we couldn't do exhibits outdoors at the Palace of Fine Arts. So we moved from one beautiful location, but a little bit isolated to another dramatic location, in this case right on the water, but right next to downtown, 
And fascinating for us at this boundary between the built environment and the natural environment. So at the boundary between city and bay is really a huge part of what this site allows us to do and allows us to explore. So it is more urban. We're intentionally trying to appeal to more older audiences. We never viewed ourselves as a children's museum, but we launched a movement that then informed many other children's museums. So now we have Thursday nights exclusively for people over 18 to make it really clear, and that works much better at the new location. We also are able to, in the new environment, have a series of different galleries. The old barn was one giant universal laboratory, but it really had all the same look and feel to it. This allows us to have some spaces that are like the old Exploratorium, but then many of them that are flooded with light and views that actually take advantage of the outdoor, outdoor setting and allows us to do large-scale phenomena like this fog bridge by the artist Fujiko Nakaya, as well as views out onto the bay and views looking back to the city. So, that's our move in a nutshell. I'll be referring to it in a couple of other ways, but really what I want to talk about today are the core ingredients of the work that we do. And we really view this triangle of the mix of content, pedagogy, and design as the three ingredients that happen in any creation that we make. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of them. Roughly speaking, the content would be the ideas or the information. The pedagogy, it's a big word. Um, somebody accused me of dropping the pedagogy bomb. Um, and it technically means a theory of teaching. We actually apply it more as a theory of learning. And it's really the who and the personal dimension. What is going on psychologically and interpersonally, even politically, between learner and teacher on two ends of a communication dialogue, if it is that. And then, of course, design is, has to do with the affordances, the specifics of the medium that you operate within. We make choices about whether a certain idea is best transferred or best spoken of in exhibits versus a digital um, experience online or in an app or whether it's best given as a lecture. So we talk a lot about medium and the design affordances for each of those media. So, of course, they blend. And of course, they're a mix. And of course, all three of them are always at play. You can never talk about pure content without an understanding of the medium in which you're talking about it and the relationship, the human relationship in which that content is being exchanged. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to separate them out. And I'll talk first about content and share what works for me is my content map. The Exploratorium is a very fractious place. We all have our independent takes on, on, on the truth. And in fact, I've, I've also talked about the Exploratorium as probably the most postmodern of the science museums, which when you get to art museums, it's a different picture. But when it comes to science museums, I'd say most science museums are still very much in a mode of Content is fixed, it is being transmitted to the audience. I think the Exploratorium is a little, bit more, um, a little bit more interested in what happens in that transaction and how it changes between different audiences and different, uh, different content purveyors. So, so this map works for me. It's how we organize the, the museum in some ways, although I think actually a project that we still need help on is understanding how to communicate it more explicitly to our visitors. So I basically talk about three nested subsets of phenomena, physical, living, and human cognitive social phenomena. And essentially, it's an evolutionary journey. You start with the whole universe, big and small, about uh, however many billion years ago you want to start that. That keeps changing. Um, about four billion years ago, a tiny little pocket of that universe developed some tricks around passing information from one generation to another via DNA or some precursor to that, and you get the living world. And then about, again, roughly two million years ago, a subset section of that, depending on whether you want to talk about exactly when that happened, developed some tricks around language and social organization that then lead to events like what we're doing right now. So those three content sets are the core kind of primary colors for the Exploratorium. Very important to this is that we view the human cognitive and social phenomena as equally part of the natural world as rocks, stars, and atoms. We're interested in that whole continuum and how you actually move back and forth between them. We do have a fourth content set, basically because of our new, our, our new location and our move, which is the environment, which cuts across all of those. It cuts across the geophysical dimensions of the environment, the biological, and then, of course, the social and technological dimensions. 
So that's our primitive content map, which does map onto space. It maps onto the space in this way. Our core, centered around our machine shop, which is our bright red area, which is our creative engine, is primarily about physics and perception. So perception is obviously a, a, at least a biological function, but we couple perception in many ways with everything we do. So the physics and perception is kind of at the heart of the Exploratorium and was the key of the old Exploratorium, although these other elements were there from the start. At the east end overlooking the bay, anchored around a life sciences laboratory and a microscope imaging station, is our living systems collection and experiences. Then facing towards the city, coupled also with a theater about this size for events that also can be open later at night on its own without opening the whole museum is an area that focuses on more on human phenomena, on sort of social and psychological phenomena. And then surrounding the site outdoors and up above on an observatory area that overlooks both the bay and the city is our focus on the environment. So content map does map onto space in certain ways. But I would say that we have a much easier time at the Exploratorium agreeing about pedagogy than we do about content. Because I'd say the core of the Exploratorium is a pedagogical idea. It's an idea about learner-driven learning, about learners as being naturally curious and not needing artificial motivation to learn, and us trying to capitalize on our natural toolkit of the senses and then extend that beyond that into empowering visitors as much as we can to create their courses through the learning. I mentioned sort of the political origins of the Exploratorium, both in terms of the time, but also its founder. And I also mentioned in our content map, by not talking about the content merely being physics and biology, but the content itself is human inquiry, human learning, and human social organization, that is the place from which every one of our visitors is starting from, in a sense. They are a learning phenomenon, encountering a bunch of these other physical and biological phenomena. So I just have a couple of pictures here to show sort of the, 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 the level of intensity and authenticity that we strive for in our visitor experiences. Um, whether it's hacking PVC to build something for a first time builder, whether it's training teachers. One of the things we found in training teachers is they're afraid of asking questions. They're afraid of not knowing. So we take them back with a very simple subject like sh light and shadows and show them how, or don't show them, we, uh, we ideally uh, allow them the opportunity to discover how easy it is to go back to asking questions and how much fun it is to start inquiring again. It turns out that light and shadows, there's a tremendous amount of education you can do with that around things that people think they know but they don't quite know. And then of course taking this across the world, we've been actually, we're, we're collaborating with the Dalai Lama's group of Tibetan monks to actually, there's a Science for Monks program, which actually involves the Exploratorium collaborating with some other entities to try to teach science based on inquiry methods. Um, and then our work that has spread across the world, this was a, a, a tinkering project that we did in Saudi Arabia. So we, we do believe, I mean, I think it's hard to claim that certain things are universal, but we do look for very accessible, very, natural points of engagement with what we call science and um, education. We also research science. We talk, um, we have a number of research projects funded by the National Science Foundation about how people learn in informal settings. So an informal setting can be the web, it can also be a museum, and we're very interested, again, in group social behavior around learning. So we publish around those things. And we even have a laboratory, this is the laboratory in our old museum, where we'll invite visitors in there and, and actually watch them in, and then modify some variables to learn from how visitors are naturally encountering the exhibits or other learning designs. One thing I just want to point out to about the human nature of learning science and around the sort of the role of, of the learner and the centrality of the learner, one thing we found very successful without fail is putting the learner back into the phenomenon in some way. This is an exhibit about drops of water. It's actually a stop motion, where, where, where you, it's not stop motion, it's, it's a high speed camera and you can time it so that you can get exactly the moment when the water splashes in a certain way and you can explore the physics of that drop happening. But you also can see yourself back in a lens there and take a picture of yourself and take a picture of this moment. So anything that allows the visitor to enter the phenomenon 
is critical. And it does. It starts to blur that boundary. But that, it, it's an element of that authorship. And I'm just going to show you different examples of that thing. We, once, we did an exhibit on mirrors. And it was initially going to be called Reflections. But the team basically called it the Science of Narcissism. Because that's really what it was about. People wanted to see themselves back reflected in the natural world, which I think is a very profound statement about what people are looking for in learning, and especially what people are looking from from science. So when science is presented as a bunch of facts that have been figured out, and I'm just going to put them out there for you, there's no mirroring going on. There's no self-to-world mirroring. And that's what we try to do in lots of subtle, small ways. So. Another example is a giant mirror. This was the centerpiece of the, sci of, of the reflections exhibit. But it's a wonderful parabolic mirror and beautiful optics lessons. But again, the beauty of seeing yourself back differently and then learning something about light in that process. This is one, I'm sure you enjoyed it on Tuesday night if you were there. Um, so um, this, this actually is a piece by Eddie Tannenbaum. It was done, it was one of the first pieces ever to take shadow capture and then translate it into a digital world. And we actually brought back the original version of this. So we want to hang on to some of our original artists, artists in residence pieces. And, and again, that thing of seeing yourself back in translated in another world is an incredibly powerful experience for many of our visitors. And last but not least, we've been exploring, um, we actually have a project called the Science of Sharing which is um, funded by the National Science Foundation to talk about social behavior and social communication. This is an exhibit about, about actually lying. This is an exhibit about emotions. But we've been looking for the affordances that allow the visitors themselves to become the exhibit, where it's actually about them and their physiological response or their interaction with other visitors. So then, of course, this process of tinkering and making where most, well, many museums, you go there and everything has been made for you. But to the extent that you can allow visitors to actually make their own environment and actually create while in the museum itself, that again creates authorship over the environment, which is increasingly rare in at least our physical environments in, this, in these days. So this is a tinkering studio, an area where, again, we try to in a sense, duplicate the experience we have on staff of learning by doing and learning by making for our visitors. So last but not least is design. And of course, design in the broadest sense encompasses thinking about content and thinking about the pedagogy or the relational aspects of it. But we also then talk about what are the affordances, what are the specifics of the medium that, that that particular medium can allow you to do. And so we're always kind of triangulating between these three, different, um, these three different poles. In the case of the Exploratorium, from the start, the machine shop was on the floor. It was a critical part of the museum. We did not hide it behind the scenes. And having that be at the center of the institution always felt very important, both for our visitors and for our staff. In our new museum, it is also visible from, in fact, more sides. And in a sense, we're trying to remove the black box, but we're also trying to say that we are a place of constant iteration. Everything on our floor is a working prototype. We intentionally don't finish them. We intentionally leave the cabinets rough and don't try to coordinate every single piece of trim on every cabinet in one gallery, because these are a series of prototypes that will continue to keep changing. We celebrate that in a number of ways, both with views into the shop, but this is a great little exhibit called the Museum of Wear and Tear that talks about the physicality of building an exhibit and all the different ways in which they break down. Um, but of course, the key of our process is the iterative design. We iterate over and over and over again. This is a little exhibit about the, the, the conservation of angular momentum, about how weights Wheels with weights distributed at different points in the wheel will have different rates of velocity and acceleration. And we started from one model, then tried to make it more visually accessible, and then ultimately allowed the visitors to slide the weights in and out so that they could experiment with that. And then in the final prototype, at least as final as it is for now, again, we weren't worrying too much about the cabinetry and all of that also sticking a, a weight there, a scale there, so that people could weigh to make sure that what the differences in weights were between them supported the inquiry. All of this happened with a great amount of visitor research and evaluation of actually studying the small little micro moments in the learning, the small little exchanges, the little modifications, and actually videotaping with visitors' permission what they do and looking for the natural learning paths through that. Another area, so those are the physical affordances. What we're increasingly looking at are the social affordances. We're actually playing with 
the, the actual, the act or social behavior as something that visitors can engage in and then actually learn about. This is, this is our group, our team Pac-Man exhibit. I don't know if any of you played with that. But one person each controls a different direction and they have to coordinate amongst each other. And you get fascinating behavior, including people standing away from the screen with an orchestrator actually telling them, right, left. So you sort of get interesting recreations of different sort of power dynamics, either democratic or orchestrated with a conductor um, in these exhibits. But there's a ton to be learned, and we're honestly still learning it, about how you get these social interactions to happen on a museum floor. This is a prisoner's dilemma exhibit. I don't know if you're familiar with a prisoner's dilemma, but it's one of these social psychology situations where you figure out whether you rat out the other person or not, and what, if you both rat each other out, you don't do very well, but if one of you does, one that person does well, but if you both don't rat each other out, then you both get set free, so it's one of those situations. Well, this is called sip or squirt, where you can either douse somebody in the face with water, or you can actually let them just have a nice, gentle sip of water. So we're trying to illustrate these phenomena. We have about five different drinking fountains, all of which have different exhibit content. We, we've taken the drinking fountain, and it's a genre that we've been exploring as an exhibit um, <laughs> genre. That and benches we've been working on too. So another thing that, that the news site in particular allows us to explore, and again, I'm talking about the prototyping. What can you do around social, I'm talking about the design process, but the core of it, not the aesthetic shell, we can do that, we do, do, do that afterwards, but the core affordances of what a certain medium allows you to do. With our new location, we're able to operate on a large scale. I don't know if you saw the fog bridge when you were there, but every half an hour, this bridge is enveloped in fog, and you see beautiful patterns, but it also becomes a display about, about appearing and disappearing and hiding and being seen. It becomes a sort of a wonderful sort of change of the whole landscape by this, by this intervention at a large scale. And then again, immersivity is something we're very interested in, not just interactivity with, with a push button or a lever, but actually taking an, a physical path through an object. This was a project called Geometry Playground, and we created a climbing structure based on this, which was a very interesting mathematical shape, but you explore it by actually traveling through it. So immersivity is, and social interactions are two of these frontiers where we're trying to understand what physical or programmatic um, design constraints lead towards the type of behavior that we're trying to encourage. So that's really the talk, is talking about giving you a sample of how we deploy these three different points of view in our work. I was talking primarily about the exhibit world. As you see, as I talked about early on, we, we, we have these same questions when we're working in a digital environment. That's just not my, my area of expertise. Um, and we have the same, the same questions when we're talking about an interpersonal, a facilitated exchange where you might have a teacher or a lecturer, or we call them explainers on the floor of our museum. But still, these three categories tend to hold, and we find that our experiences are weak if they're missing any one of the three, and that there are different sensibilities for each of the three, and that we often have to compose the team with a mix of different people who are able to not only advocate for the content or the design, but also be good at actually translating and working with others who are actually advocating for the other point of view. So there you go, there's our, our building. You saw that the other night, and again, that's the classic exploratorium, but thank you very much. <laughs>